Hey math friends, welcome. Let me know in the comments if you are watching live or if you are watching the replay. I am so very glad that you are here. Also in the comments, um, introduce yourself. Let me know your name and what grade you teach. You are in the right place if you are um, an upper elementary math teacher or you work with students who are struggling with their multiplication facts. Um, I will tell you that this workshop, or I designed this workshop specifically for fourth and fifth grade math teachers. Um, so I think there would be strategies that would be helpful for third grade teachers, um, but I did not design this in a way that we are really thinking about students um, who are just being introduced to multiplication. This is really for our students who um, have come to us in fourth and fifth grade and they are still struggling with their multiplication facts. This is for you. So um, I'm gonna pull up the comments on my phone so that way I can interact with y'all and I can see, um, okay, perfect. Hi, Sharon and Beth and Jennifer and Lauren and Chris, Kendra, Andy, awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome. Okay, we are going to jump right in. So I will tell you this. This workshop was not designed to convince anybody why the strategies that we typically use or the strategies that we learned our multiplication facts with, this was not designed to convince you why those are not effective. Um, specifically like time tests and drill and kill with you know, memorizing all of our facts. If you teach fourth or fifth grade, you know that those strategies are not effective for every student because we have students who come to us and consistently do not know their facts. Let me know in the comments if that is you. If you have students, you may not know your students yet for this year. Some of you have already started uh, school for the year. Some of you have not, but let's think in years past. How many of you have students who come to you in fourth and fifth grade and still do not know their multiplication facts? I hope that you see in the comments there will probably be other teachers who are right there with you. So it's not uncommon. And the reason it's not uncommon is because a lot of times we're not teaching multiplication facts in a way that is one, evidence-based, um, but also that builds understanding or has any type of meaning. So we are gonna jump right in. We're going to, just to kind of give you like a little agenda of what we're gonna cover. So we are gonna talk about what fluency is. We're gonna talk about the two different types of facts strategies that you can use to teach the two different types of facts, how to support our students in fourth and fifth grade who don't yet know their facts, but we are still expected to teach them grade level content. And then if you are a member of Mix and Math 360, um, then I'm gonna walk you through the um, resource. I'm seriously in love with this resource. I cannot wait to show it to you. I'm gonna walk you through this resource so you can see how you can take this resource and incorporate it into your classroom um, daily if you want. That is, the entire resource is based on the strategies that I'm teaching today. It is strategy-based practice, not memorization. So I can't wait to show that to you. And then depending on how long we go, we may do a Q&A at the end. So we'll see. But let me go ahead and switch my screen over. Um, let's see. Okay, give me a thumbs up in the comment if you can see. My screen, okay, Sherry says every year she has students who don't know their facts. Yes, Jennifer said that, Sherry said that. It's, um, yes, you're not alone. So let's talk about what is fluency. So um, NCTM, which I quote NCTM all the time, they are really like the gold standard when it comes to math education. Um, really all of the strategies that I share um, in this workshop are either from NCTM or they are based on um, learning that I've done from NCTM and have implemented in my own classroom over the years. So um, let's dive into what is fluency. So fluency is our students can demonstrate fluency in math when they can flexibly, accurately, and efficiently solve problems. So it's not just speed and accuracy. A lot of times when we think about math facts, we think about that as can they get it quickly and is it right? But NCTM and really anybody who talks about fluency um, really says that it's based on these three components. So one, is it accurate? Of course, we want a correct answer. Can they get to that answer efficiently? So are they having to like count one by one or having, are they having to make tally marks? Like is it an efficient strategy? Are they choosing, choosing a, um, a strategy that is appropriate for that situation? So maybe like skip counting by twos may be efficient if we're talking about two times six. Not as efficient if we're talking about two times 12. So 
thinking about a strategy that is efficient and then also flexible. So part of flexibility is being able to um, solve problems in multiple ways. Um, and it kind of goes along with choosing strategies that are appropriate for the problem at hand. So really it is all three components, that is fluency. And so we really need to think about anytime we are assessing multiplication facts, anytime we are practicing them, are we giving students an opportunity to demonstrate all three parts of fluency? So let's actually take a look at what this all three parts look like in the classroom. So let's see, oh, there we go. Let's look at student A. So student A may say, I think that six times eight is 48. Now, is this response accurate? Yes. Is their thinking flexible? Now, just based off that one sentence, we don't know that, but this is why it's so important to probe. So if we ask the student, well, how did you get to six times eight is 48? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. How would your student respond to that? Why do you think six times eight is 48? Um, I know there's a little bit of delay on the comments in the live video. So I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you in the past how I've had students respond. They would say, oh, I just know it. Or, oh, I learned this song or this rhyme for six times eight. And if those are the only ways, if a student just says, I just know it, then that means they are not flexible in their thinking um, for this fact. They don't have any other way to prove that six times eight is 48. Now let's take a look at another student. So student B. Now this student says, I think six times eight is 46. Now, is this response accurate? No, but is their thinking flexible? Well, again, we don't know this unless we probe. And so I would ask this student, tell me why you think six times eight is 46. Notice I didn't change the way that I asked that. We don't want our questions to kind of like lead students or hint students into thinking that their answer is either right or wrong, it's perfectly okay to ask a student to explain their thinking, whether they have a right answer or a wrong answer. So student B, why? tell me why you think six times eight is 46. Now this student, instead of saying, I just know it, they go into this explanation. And so I have a picture of what their thinking might look like, and I'm gonna kind of talk you through it as they are explaining it in their brain. So they may say, well, I know that six times eight is the same as six groups of eight. And if I know that five groups of eight is 40, and if I add one more group of eight, I get 48. Oh, it's not 46, it's 48. Okay, so if you see, I'm gonna pause right here, step out of my student, uh, my student brain. So if you look at this, this visual here, it shows what that student did in their brain, or maybe even what they showed on paper. They showed five groups of eight, and then they added one more group, and they got to 48. And they recognized that, oh wait, it's not 46, it's 48. So let's go through our questions again. Is this answer accurate now? Yes. Is their thinking flexible? Absolutely it is. And then, is the strategy they used efficient? Yes, this was a very efficient strategy. Now, this student very well could have said, well, I know it's six times 48, and they could have started drawing all these little tally marks on their paper. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you have students in fourth or fifth grade who uh, use the tally marks for everything when it comes to multiplication facts. Um, I always had some students who did that. And so anyways, they could have explained their answer or proved that their answer was right or wrong with tally marks. And if that were the case, then no, they wouldn't be efficient, but they chose a very efficient strategy here. And so I wanna ask you, do you want math students who can recall math facts quickly, but they really struggle to reason through their mistakes or apply what they know to more challenging problems? Student A could recall that fact really quickly, but they had no way to assess if their answer was reasonable or if it was correct and they definitely didn't have a strategy that they could apply to any other problems. They had memorized that one fact. So the flip side of that is, do we want students who have a wealth of strategies to use to solve challenging problems, recognize and correct mistakes, and progress towards fluency? Because let me tell you this, that strategy that that student used um, to figure out what was it, six times eight? That's the same strategy that we could use and that students could use to figure out a problem like 11 times 13. If we know 10 times 13, if we know 10 groups of 13, 
which a lot of us can say, oh, it's 130. Well, then all they have to do is add one more group of 13 to get the answer. And so this strategy, they can apply this to really big numbers. Honestly, it's something that they can use when we're talking about fractions or um, multi-digit multiplication. So these strategies are really important and we want students who have that flexibility. So let me check the comments. Give me a thumbs up if you're still with me, if this makes sense, if we understand why the thinking behind student B is the type of, that, that's our goal. That's what we want to move towards. That's the type of, um, we want our instruction to build that in students versus the student who only knows isolated facts. All right, I'm checking the comments. Yes, Rhonda said it's creating better number sense. I see some thumbs up. Awesome. Um, Ms. Harner said, I asked them to show me how you got the answer. That is so incredibly important for us to be asking students, how did you get this? Why do you think this? Can you show me another way? Um, I think that a lot of times if we are assessing multiplication facts with just you know, a worksheet and just has the facts and that's it, we really don't have much insight on where students' thinking is at, where they're thinking, I'm trying to be plural and singular, so where a child's thinking is at basically. And so um, it would be more effective to sit down and ask students one fact at a time. Um, and then over time, we can see where they're at with different strategies, but we'll dive into that. So are we teaching students isolated facts or are we preparing their thinking for more challenging math? So over on Instagram, I asked a couple days ago if you had heard of foundational facts and derived facts. And about 70% of the people who responded on the post. Some said they had heard of it, but they had no idea what it meant. About 54% said never heard of it at all. So that's what we're gonna dive into. So when we're talking about multiplication facts, there are actually two different categories of facts. So we have foundational facts, and our foundational facts are our zeros, ones, twos, fives, and tens. Um, I like to call these our building block facts sometimes, and I'll show you why in just a bit. But our foundational facts are our ones that are just critically important. They're ones that typically students get a whole lot quicker. Um, and so we'll talk about how we use these here in just a bit. And we'll also talk about how we can build students' understanding of these individual um, foundational facts as well. Then we have our derived facts, and our derived facts are our threes, fours, six, seven, eights, nines, elevens, twelves. Some people consider elevens and twelves multiplication facts; others don't. I included it in this um, in this workshop today, but regardless, these come from specific strategies. The reason they're called derived facts is because we use our foundational facts or our building block facts in order to create um, or build these other facts. So if we know our ones and our twos, we can use that to help us find our threes. If we know our fives, we can use that to help us find our sixes. And so I don't want you to stress out, I'm gonna show you some visuals for this. So these are the two categories of facts. Now let's talk about how we can build understanding for each type of fact. So our zeros and ones, which by the way, I probably should have adjusted this in my workshop. These are not the facts that I would start with. Um, I would actually start with our twos and then probably tens, fives, and then zeros and ones. But regardless, this is all in order here. So um, zeros and ones. A lot of times when we are teaching students our zeros and ones, we teach them the rule that if you're multiplying by zero, the answer is going to be zero. And if you're multiplying by one, the answer is going to be, you know, the number that you're multiplying by. And we don't want to teach students the rule because there's a ton of rules in math. And a lot of times they're getting a ton of rules depending on what their instruction looks like. But these facts are really easy when we focus in on the meaning of multiplication as equal groups. It just makes sense. So let's think about our zeros and our ones in the context of like baskets of apples. So say you go to a, um, I was going to say strawberries, but we're talking about apples, an apple farm. Is that a thing? If it's a thing, they do not have them around here. But say you go to an apple farm and you see baskets of apples and you walk away with zero baskets. Well, how many apples do you have? Zero, because you have zero, zero groups of however many are in the basket. It doesn't matter because you have no groups. So it makes sense that the answer is zero. We don't have to boil that down to a rule. This is something students will see when they um, are provided instruction that is meaningful, that has context, that um, leans on the meaning of multiplication as equal groups. Same thing with our one specs. If we go to an apple farm and there are eight 
apples in every basket and we walk away with one basket, of course the answer is going to be eight because we just have one group of that. So foundational facts, zeros and ones, I would encourage you to focus on the meaning of multiplication as equal groups and not worry about the rule. The rule will come, they'll see that, they'll see that pattern. Our twos, so students usually master their twos relatively quickly out of all the facts. These, this is where I would start. Um, and they can either do that by skip counting by twos, or this is also our addition doubles, which students should have experience, especially by fourth and fifth grade. We should have students who have experience with this. Of course, you are always going to have outliers in your class, um, students who, who learn differently and um, maybe their needs haven't been met in previous years. And so I say all of this, like generally our students can grasp our twos pretty quickly. Um, but if, if students don't, this is where you start, skip counting and addition doubles. Our fives, which like I said, I would do these after our tens. Again, skip counting by five or finding half of our tens facts. So if I know three times 10 is 30, then five times 10, or sorry, if I know three times 10 is, um, is 30, then I know three times five is going to be 15. So um, fives facts, students can usually grasp pretty well. And then we have our tens, whoops. I don't know why, there we go, it didn't show up for me. Our tens facts, and this is just patterns in base 10. So as students are working on place value, as they understand our number system, students can also skip count by 10. I feel like that's a really early one for students to get as far as skip counting, but these are our foundational facts. And this is kind of where we can focus our attention in building um, their understanding of these foundational facts, because these really are the building blocks for everything else. If you have students in your classroom who do not have their zeros, ones, twos, fives, tens down, that is absolutely where our focus should be before we even start thinking about any of the other facts. And a lot of times, you know, some, some resources will teach you to go just down the line, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. But our fives facts is actually, are actually going to be easier than our threes. And our, um, our, I don't know, fives facts are gonna be easier than our fours as well. So um, start with the foundational facts. All right, so I wanna show you this really quick. So if we were to teach students every single multiplication fact in isolation, they would have to memorize over 100 facts. That is intimidating and that is probably why we see students coming to us who do not have their facts down. But, if we look at this, I'm going to do some modification to um, some modifying this multiplication chart. What I've highlighted here are all of the foundational facts. Now, let me know in the comments if you think it's fair to say that zeros, ones, twos, fives, and tens are relatively easy for the majority of students. Like I said, we know we always have our outliers. We know our, we have our students who um, who learn differently. <laughs> Thank you, Rhonda. Rhonda corrected me in the comments. She said apple orchard. That's what it's called, not an apple farm. Um, but let me know in the comments if you agree that these foundational facts, zeros, ones, twos, fives, and tens, typically students can grasp. And so when we look at this multiplication chart and we look at just the foundational facts here, I've highlighted all of them, that dramatically cuts the number of facts that students need to memorize or learn. Um, I mean, really more than half. And now if we cut it in half, because if we, um, if students understand the commutative property, which we talked about this, we talked about the commutative property um, in our book study over the summer about how situations are not commutative. You can't just change, oh, six times eight and eight times six, and we're talking about real world and we're talking about that context. But when we're talking about multiplication facts, it is fair for students to say, or for students to recognize that, oh, I know that six times eight is the same as eight times six, as long as we, they truly have an understanding of it. Um, and again, it's not just another rule. But when we do that, we cut about half of our multiplication chart in half. So let's look at what's left. These blue facts here. These are the facts that if we all just said that the pink facts, that it's fair to say that those are usually the ones that come easier to students. Um, they've got those. Look at the number of facts now. I think I counted it's less than 25. It's less than 25 facts that students need to learn. And when I say learn, I don't mean memorize. We are gonna talk about how students can get to this. But I think this visual is really powerful for us to see that it, we, we don't need a chart that has, you know, 100 facts on it and we see like, okay, how many do students know out of 100 or however many there are? So let's talk about our derived facts because these blue, um, these 
blue squares, these are all derived facts. So let's talk about how we can um, build students' understanding of the derived facts or how we can get them to be fluent with derived facts. Now, I'm not going to show you different strategies for each fact. Instead, I'm gonna show you three strategies that you can pair with your building block facts or your foundational facts, two different names for them. Um, three strategies you can pair with those and students can get any fact. So the first is going to be add or take away groups from a foundational fact. So if we know our twos and we know this strategy, we can get our threes. If we know our fives and we get this strategy, we can get our sixes. If we know this strategy, and we know our tens, we can figure out our nines. So take a look at the um, 10 frames below, um, right, right below the text. Um, this is gonna be one of the visuals that I talk about in just a bit. This visual is used all throughout the resource um, that comes along with this workshop. But let's look at the very first 10 frame, the one at top, up top. So this one is showing, um, this one is showing six groups of four. Now, if you look at the black dots, we've got five groups of four. And so students know five groups of four is 20. And then we have one more group. So we're just adding another group of four, which gives us 24. So six groups of four is 24. And if we look at the bottom, um, the bottom 10 frame, here we see 10 groups of three but we're taking away that white group. We're taking away one group of three. So the strategy here or the thinking behind it is, well, I know 10 groups of three is 30, but I don't need 10 groups. I only need nine groups. So let me take one of those groups of three away and I have 27. So do you see how we, are, um, how we can use this strategy to derive other facts? This is the exact same type of thinking that student B at the beginning of the workshop was using. So, Another strategy is double the product of a foundational or a known fact. So um, if we know our twos and we know how to double the product there, we get our fours. Threes can be sixes. Our fours can help us with our eights. So again, you see the 10 frame here. We've got um, the first one, we've got six groups of five. So if we can figure out three groups of five and then double that, then we know the product of six groups of five. If we know the product of four groups of three, and then we double that, we know the product of eight groups of three. So we're using what students are strong at. We're using understanding that they have to figure out some of these more challenging facts. And then lastly, we have a, the strategy break down a factor to create two groups of known facts. This can be known facts or it can be foundational facts. So the very first 10 frame here, we have um, seven groups of three and we've broken seven groups of three. Hopefully you're, you're with me right now. Hopefully you see how I'm using these 10 frames. The black is one fact and the white is another fact and we're using those two to figure out the goal fact. So give me a thumbs up in the comments if this is making sense. So we're breaking down a factor to create two groups of known facts. So we've, instead of thinking about seven times three, we're breaking it down to five groups of three, which is a foundational fact, and two groups of three, which is a foundational fact. These are things that students can do, but we have to give them experience and we have to be really intentional with the activities that we're using so that they can become fluent in these strategies and apply them to all the facts. Um, the bottom uh, group of 10 frames here, um, this one is 12 times four. So in the first 10 frame, the black dots, we've got 10 groups of four. Well, to figure out 12 groups of four, we just need to add another two groups. So we've got 10 groups of four is 40, and then two groups of four is eight. And so we know that 12 groups of four is going to be 48. Good, I see some thumbs up in the comments. See it makes sense from Sheldon, awesome. So these are our three strategies. Now, how can we, build students understanding of these strategies? Well, one is visual models. So we use the visual models to one, emphasize that multiplication is grouping or it's equal groups. And so there are actually a ton of different models that you can use to show this. You can use manipulatives, you can use pictures, you can use arrays. Um, but one model that I think is really overlooked is actually the 10 frame, which is what I um, was just showing you on the past couple of slides, and I've got another one here, but I think this is overlooked because I think it does such a wonderful job of showing the groups. It's a visual that students should have experience with from previous grades. And so now we're just taking a visual that they're comfortable with 
and we are um, using it to build their understanding of these strategies. So the resource that you, um, if you're a member, that you get along with this workshop, this is actually a screenshot from one of the resources. And so it says, use the 10 frame to complete the multiplication equation below. So the black circles, what multipl multiplication fact is modeled from those black circles? Well, let's see, in one group, we've got, what is that, seven? Um, one group, we've got seven, so we've got five groups of seven, so we do five times seven is 35. And then we've got the white circles, so one group of seven is seven. And then we've got six groups of seven all together, all of the circles together is 42. So we're using this tens frame to build the understanding, build students' understanding of that strategy, to give them practice with that strategy. So we've got the visuals, whether you're using arrays or a 10 frame or using manipulatives, whatever visual um, or an invented visual that a student creates on their own. That's one way to build their understanding of these strategies, build their fluency with these strategies. Another way is um, number strings. So number strings are intentionally selected series of problems that lead students towards a specific strategy or way of thinking, and that's what a number string is. So they encourage students to consider how the thinking that was used in previous problems can actually help them solve upcoming problems. So I wanna show you an example of this. And of course, this is a screenshot from the resource that you're getting along with this workshop. So this is an example of two different number strings. So the first one we've got, so the goal here is for students to be able to solve 12 times four using the strategy, um, either add, or, add you know, two groups or break a factor down into two known facts. Th those two strategies can kind of overlap. Um, but we start with 10 times four. And we would ask student, a student, maybe you're doing this in a number talk, we'd ask a student to solve it. We'd talk about how they knew it. A lot of times students like, this is a foundational fact, they've got it. And then we've got two times four. And you know, students share what the answer is to that. And then we put up 12 times four. And we leave 10 times four and two times four on the board. And we ask them, how can you use the problems that you just solved to help you figure out 12 times four. If you know 10 groups of four and you know two groups of four, how might you figure out 12 groups of four? And so that's what a number string is. You can see another example to the side. They're all throughout for every fact. Um, and um, yeah, for every fact, I was gonna say in every strategy. Oh yeah, and in every strategy. We've got number strings for every strategy as well. So this might look a little bit different if like say you're doing your doubles. So um, maybe you do your, your, your two, you know, two times whatever. And then it's like, okay, well, how can you use that to help you find four groups of that? And that would be to encourage students to double. So that is our number string strategy. And then this next one, um, this is really important, providing real world examples. When we provide context to multiplication facts, it gives them something to visualize and it also brings the strategies to life. This can be done through really simple story problems. So think of back to the, just a few minutes ago when I was talking about the apple orchard, not the apple uh, farm. So think about when I was talking about the apple orchard. So, well now, now you've got me thinking, is it orchard or orchard? Orchard, that phonetically makes sense, right? This is why I teach math. So anyways, you can tell we don't have one around us. Um, but when talking about apples in the basket there, we're gonna use that. The apples in the baskets, that made sense to us. The zeros and the ones facts made sense because we had context to it. That context wasn't earth shattering. It wasn't there to really challenge students like critical thinking skills. It was just there to give them something to visualize, to give them something to relate back to. And it reinforced or really um, just helped students see what that strategy was. It helped them see oh, we're adding another group or, oh, we're splitting the groups that we have into two like separate groups or known facts. And so let's look, take a look at an example. And this is from the resource again. So hot dogs are sold in packs of eight. If Daniel buys 10 packs for a party, how many hot dogs does he have? So here we've got 10 groups of eight or 10 times eight. But Daniel gets home and realizes that he has one more pack of unopened hot dogs in his freezer how many hot dogs does he have now? So they're seeing with this context, oh, I'm adding another group of eight and now I'm solving 11 times eight. So I can figure out 11 times eight because I already know 10 times eight. I'm just adding another group. So this context really brings this strategy to life. Now, okay, before I uh, go into supporting students, because I know this is a question that I always get. It's like, okay, I can't spend all day, you know, working on this, the, these 
concepts because they're from third grade. Like I need to be teaching, especially if you're in fifth grade, I need to be teaching multi-digit multiplication. How do I do that when students don't even know their facts? We're going to dive into that. I want to check the comments. Um, okay. Ms. Harner said, I cannot wait to show your video to other teachers. Um, Sharon gave me a thumbs up. Amanda said, what to use to assess what facts they know and need help with if drills are not appropriate. Okay. We'll talk about that as well. So let's dive into how we support students. So I already kind of already talked about this. We have our students, we have to teach grade level concepts, but they don't have their facts. What can we do? The first is to use numbers that are more friendly. And what I mean by this is when we are talking about like multi-digit multiplication, or we're talking about um, division, division of multi-digit whole numbers, or even decimals, use digits in those numbers that are our foundational facts. So it's going to be easier for students to access those grade level concepts if we're using numbers like twos, um, fives, maybe even some threes. It doesn't have to be foundational facts, but maybe just ones that are more known by your students. Um, ones, obviously, zero. That's going to allow them to access the thinking that you are trying to teach at this grade level with numbers that are appropriate for where they're at. So it doesn't make sense for us to not even let students work on multi-digit multiplication because they don't know those facts. Well, when they do finally know the facts, well, now they've missed multi-digit multiplication. And so we're just continuing to push them further and further behind. So we want to, it's okay to make modifications using friendly numbers. Um, one option, I talk about this all the time. Sometimes I feel like a broken record, but I know that not everybody watches everything I put out like I think they do. And so um, when we are talking about um, number choices, I love to provide numberless word problems and then provide pairs of numbers below them that students can choose and insert into the problem and solve it that way. So the numbers kind of at the beginning of that progression, the, the number pairs kind of progress. At the beginning of that pro progression, I would use numbers that are more easily modeled, that have those friendly numbers. So a student who does not know um, their multiplication facts is not working on a number like 979 times 86. I mean, that's just asking a student who doesn't know their facts to give up right away. But we still want them to be able to access the thinking. We still want them to be able to learn how to use an area model. So that's one option. Another option is to provide temporary support tools, such as multiplication charts. Now, I tip it, sometimes I get some pushback on this, but I want to give you an example, kind of a real world example here. So when I was playing volleyball in college, I completely wrecked my knee. I had four knee surgeries and I really spent like the last two years of college essentially on and off crutches. Now, those crutches allowed me to continue life. It allowed me to continue to go to class and continue to, you know, drive to appointments or because, you know, I wouldn't be able to actually like walk into the office building if I didn't have those crutches. It allowed me to keep moving forward, but they didn't give me the crutches and say, okay, like just use them until you can walk again. Like I had to go to physical therapy. And so while I was using those crutches, I was doing things to build up my strength and to heal. And those crutches gave me the freedom and the space to do that. Because if I tried to walk on the let and on my knee without the crutches, I probably would have injured myself further. It kept me safe. It allowed me to move forward while I was building up that strength. These multiplication charts, these support tools are just like those crutches. They allow students to access grade level concepts while you are building their, their fluency with their multiplication facts so that eventually they won't need that multiplication chart anymore, but when they don't need that anymore, they will have they they will already have the understanding of like multi-digit multiplication that they can now apply those facts to. So it allows students to keep moving forward um, even when we are still working separately, maybe in some type of intervention time or um, however you decide to use the resource that I'm going to give you. Um, they are still working on that there, but they can still participate in grade level content. So those are two ways that we can really support students there. Now, okay, I want to show you um, Rhonda, always hyping me up in the comments. She said, preach, sister. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to actually show you what these resources look like because um, at this point, this was the extent of the workshop. So you kind of have an understanding of why we designed the resources the way we did. You have an idea of how you can use them in your classroom. Um, and all of that. So let me just go ahead and swipe over and show you. Give me a thumbs up in the comments if you can see these. So, okay, 
So you are being given this teacher guide and this teacher guide is fantastic because it basically summarizes everything that I just shared in two pages. Um, maybe not everything, like I didn't go into, um, you know, the support tools or anything like that, but it, it summarizes a lot of it. So that way, um, you can refer back to this. It's got the, the foundational facts, the derived facts, the different strategies. And then we have um, some math mats here. Now these math mats, they're just called multiplication frames. You can see there are some blank ones. There's ones, twos, threes, fours, all the way up to nine. Um, so the way that I envision you using these, one, you can pair them with the other resources that I'm about to show you in this like bundle of resources. Um, but also basically what students can do, they can write a fact up top and they can either circle the number of like spaces that they need. So let's say on this one, they have, um, what is this? Eight. They have three times eight. They can circle, you know, two groups of eight and one group of eight to make three times eight. They can color in the dots, however they want to do that. But it just gives them a space to be able to, um, like think about these facts more deeply. But I also provided a blank one. So if you wanted to use cubes and you wanted to have students model it that way, um, you totally can. And when I say cubes, I mean like counters or like little centimeter cubes, not like the problem solving strategy. Um, so these are gonna be a great tool for you if you're working for student, working with students, maybe in um, a teacher led small group or a teacher facilitated small group, or if you have students working on things independently and they need it. Um, these would be great for assessing students' understanding of what they know about a multiplication fact. So if we ask students, you know, what is four times six? Can they use the, um, can they use some strategy? Maybe they use the math mat to show you their understanding of four times six. Um, okay, so we've got that. And then this is the part that I think you are really, really going to love. So um, here's the implementation guide for our like practice pages. So one of the resources that we gave you maybe in the spring sometime were the quick checks. These are just like the quick checks. And so they look like this. Let me zoom out a little bit. So what these are is they include all three components that I talked about of how to build students' understanding of the facts and the strategies. So we've got the visual here um, with the 10 frame. So this one is a building block fact. I use the term building block fact on here because it's more kid friendly than foundational fact, but we know that these are the same thing. Um, and so this one's for zeros and ones. So how many, um, how many groups of five are in the top row? One group of five is five. How many are in the bottom row? Well, there's no, no groups of five. So it would be zero. We've got our number strings here, and then we've got context to really bring this to life. So there are 60 pages of these, and they go from our building block facts to the strategies. And so we've got the strategies here. And so um, if the add and subtract a group strategy um, is beneficial for like our threes and our sixes and our nines and our elevens. And so um, we've got these, I think it's five per fact. So we've got like five for our threes and five for our sixes and, and, and so forth. Um, same three strategies. So these are really consistent. I wanted to keep the design consistent so that students can work on these without really any support from you. And here's why I also gave you the math mats, because if we're going to have students work independently, we want them to be able to have tools to assess whether their answers are correct. Or um, we don't want it to, we don't want it to be that we're giving this to a student who hasn't mastered this fact and they have no support tools. So that math mat paired with some um, cubes is a support tool or the math mat with the gray circles already in it is a support tool. Um, so you've got this, there's 60 pages of that. So however you want to use those, um, whatever makes sense for your students in your class structure. And let me scroll down. Obviously we've got an answer key for all that. All right, then we have a game that I'm super excited about. So this is called Build a Fact. And so basically it is a way um, for them, oh goodness, my husband's, uh, my husband's AirPods are trying to connect to my computer. So Build a Fact. So this is a way for students to, in a really engaging, fun game, apply what they know about the foundational facts and the strategies. So the way that this is played I'm gonna turn this here. So the way that this is played is they um, they spin the spinner, they land on a fact. So let's say they land on nine times three. 
Well, they have to use their building block facts to make nine times three. And there's a recording sheet down here for students to record. But they use their building block facts, so they may decide, and it could be different from, from student to student. A student could do five and two and two. They could do 10 and one because they're taking away a group from 10. And so they'll cross off the facts that they use, they'll record it on the recording sheet, and then their opponent will go. And the goal is to be able to cross off all your building block facts. The first team to do that wins. So again, you can use those math mats I showed you earlier in the resource to really support students if they need additional visuals. I added these visuals here so that students could use that, but if they really need to like model it out, they can. Um, but it's a fun fact fluency practice game um, that is based on strategies. It is not based on speed. It is not based on um, memorization. Every child can participate. Every student can participate in this activity or in this game. So that is the game. And there's game boards for, obviously, the foundational facts are the ones that are right here, the building block facts. Um, so there's game boards for all of the derived facts up to nine. Um, and you have those there and the recording sheet. So one thing that's not included here, and I thought about this too late, but I am going to get it added this week, is um, cards, kind of like subitizing cards, but they are going to be cards that have the 10 frame and they show like one, one times one and then another one that shows like two times one and so forth with all of the facts. Because I think a lot of times we want to play these really fun games in the classroom um, like war or go fish or whatever it is with flashcards. And we know that flashcards are, for, for students who know the facts, they're great. For students who don't know the facts, it doesn't provide them any opportunity um, to, fig to figure them out or reason. And so doing this, those same exact games, but with these 10 frame cards is so powerful. So I'm gonna get those thrown together for you, get them added. You'll just have to re-download the PDF, but um, that is that. So let me switch over here. Um, okay, awesome. I'm going to check into the comments, see where we are at. So Rachel said, um, is this being sent to our email or is it just on the website? And actually I did have the link for you. I wanted to show you that. Um, okay, there we go. So if you wanna download these, these are already in your membership portal. If you're not a member, if, when you sign up, this link will work for you. Um, but if you are a member, which the majority of you are, um, you will be able to see them right at this link. You'll see the, um, once this workshop is over, I'll download it and upload it right to the portal. So you'll see that, you'll see the resources, and you'll also see a PD certificate as well um, for this workshop. So um, we have a few minutes, so I'm going to dive into some, um, some questions here. Let me refresh my um, my chat down here. Okay. Um, all right. So we talked about assessment or we had a question about assessment. So how do we assess students? I would say the strongest way to assess and actually another thing now that I just thought about it, I'm going to add this as well. The benefit of being a member is you get all of the additions to it. So I'm going to add those cards. I'm also going to take if you have our data trackers. Um, I'm actually going to take that exact form and I'm going to um, label them with the strategies and the foundational facts. And that will just give you a way to kind of organize and see um, what students know what. So our foundational facts. I actually, with the foundational facts, am not really opposed to, um, not timed, but maybe if you're working in a small group, like I really think observation is the best tool here. Observation and interview. So if you're working with a small group, um, if you see that a student is doing, I, I don't know, if they're having to like count on their fingers, not that counting on our fingers is bad because it is a visual, but if we're seeing that they don't, they're not fluent, they're, they don't have efficient strategies, they don't have an accurate way um, to figure out the answer or they don't have a um, flexible way to figure out the answer, an accurate answer, um, then obviously we know that they're not fluent with that fact. So I'm gonna add that as well, the data tracker, so you have that. But I would say observations and interviews, those are gonna be your best things. So if you are um, giving students maybe one of these pages and you see that they're really struggling, I would, I would bet that most students don't know these strategies or aren't fluent in these strategies. They may be at the starting point, um, but even our students who have all of their multiplication facts memorized, 
they don't know them flexibly. Like they don't have number sense in this way. Um, so it honestly benefits all students, even students who know their multiplication facts to be going through these activities. So um, somebody said, if drills aren't appropriate, if drills aren't appropriate, I would use that, which I think, we're, I don't know what you mean necessarily by drills, but like drill and kill. Um, yeah, I would not say that that's appropriate or maybe, I, I don't even say the word appropriate. I would say it's not research-based. It's not proven to be effective for all students. Um, so I would go the route of using a resource like the one that you are getting. Um, let's see, do we have these digitally as well? This is not a digital resource. This is only in print. Um, Karen, Karen and Brenda and Angie and Rachel are saying all positive things about the resource. I'm so in love with this resource. I'm so incredibly excited to get it out to you. Um, we have had, it's been me and several other teachers who have worked on this resource and then um, a wonderful designer who put it all together. So I'm super, super excited to get it in your hands. Um, it just, it, it came out better than I like ever envisioned it. So um, let's see, Rhonda said, do you think you would ever create a resource like this one that is using an area model, like using a 10 by 10 grid? Ooh, Rhonda, you and I talk all the time. You, let, let, let's chat about this and see. Um, okay. Uh, awesome. Okay. I don't think, okay. Angie said, is there ever an appropriate time to use timed fact quizzes? Um, okay. I'm going to be incredibly honest with you. So I really, really, and this is just for me. I feel like I have relatively good number sense. I mean, I dive into teach, talk with teachers about math all day long. Anytime there is any amount of pressure, it really makes me second guess myself. When I was even talking through like the the um, 10 frames with you live, I mean, I, I, I felt like just a little bit of hesitation. Um, I was talking to my husband about this the other day, tipping. I bring out a calculator to tip because the pressure makes me second guess myself, even though I know if there were no pressure and I know the waiter wasn't right next to me and my husband wasn't waiting on me, like I could figure out the tip. I know that. Um, and so I think about that when I think about students. I don't, I personally would not ever use a timed test. I think that there are better ways. I think the time is to see if students are efficient, but remember efficient doesn't necessarily mean speed. And so um, I just would never use a timed test. But when I think about myself as somebody who, you know, knows math and is really flexible in their thinking, feeling the pressure of the time, I just, I, I don't want to put students in that situation. So I'm not shaming or judging anybody who does use time tests. This is completely my opinion. I would encourage you to Google time tests, Google the research, um, see what NCTM has to say about it, and then decide if it's something that you still want to move forward with. Um, let's see. Okay, awesome. I think that is all for tonight. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Um, whether you join me live or whether you watch the replay. Um, if you are a member, definitely go into our Mix and Math 360 Facebook group. Please share your takeaway with me, um, something that you're gonna maybe change in your classroom, something you learned. If you are not yet a member, but you are in the Upper Elementary Math Teachers Facebook group, I would love if you shared this workshop out with them, shared your takeaway. Um, it's always really helpful for me to hear what resonates with you, um, what questions you still have. I am going to sign off and spend time with my boys, get them in bed real quick, but I will definitely be, once I get them down, I'll jump into the comments. Um, if there's anything that I didn't answer tonight, I'm happy to support, but thank you all for what you do. Wishing you all the best as you go back to school. And thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have such a wonderful rest of your day.